Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Well, today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners, and uh, I want to thank uh, Janet for her support, and uh, we'll be sending along access to our premium site, as we do with all donations of $7 or more. Well, now it is time to get into today's episode of Yours uh, Truly, Johnny Dollar. We begin a new series. It's time for The Broderick Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. My name's Steele, Mr. Dollar, Claims Division, Eastern Trust Insurance Company. Steele? You don't know me, Mr. Dollar. People at Universal Adjustment suggested I contact you. Thought you might be interested in helping me pay off a claim. Okay, tell me about it, Mr. Steele. One of our policyholders passed away last month, and we can't seem to locate his beneficiary. She just doesn't seem to be around. Maybe she doesn't want the money. Everybody wants money, Mr. Dollar, especially insurance money. Be there in an hour. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Broderick matter. Expense account item one, 25 cents, bus fare. My apartment to the Eastern Trust Insurance Building in the office of Robert Steele. He was a big sandy-haired man in a tweed suit. We shook hands, looked each other over, and then got down to business. Now, Mr. Dollar, the deceased policyholder was named John Smith. John Adam Smith, age 67. Died in City Hospital, Charity Ward, 22nd of last month. Death certificate. Mm Mm-hmm. Pneumonia. And other things. What other things? The intern who signed that certificate says Smith was pretty run down. Evidences of malnutrition, possible TB history. Not noted here, Mr. Steele. Doesn't make any difference. Smith was able to stand the exam for the policies when they were issued in 1943. Uh Uh-huh. You got him there? Yes. 1,500 total. Beneficiary, Lorraine Broderick. She the one you can't locate? She's the one. Any other possible heirs, uh, family or anyone? No, Smith was all alone. No problems there. Any other material that might help to find Lorraine Broderick? No, this stuff here, it might help you. I don't know. I just don't know. You sound discouraged, Mr. Steele. $1,500 isn't a lot of money, and the chances are Lorraine Broderick won't even remember John Adam Smith when you do find her. But I hope you do. I... <laughs> I'm explaining this badly. Look here. You see? Mm-hmm. And here. And here. It's the same all through the book. Smith was absolutely religious about his payments. Never missed a one. Never let it slide one day. Now, I bet I've got the record of 20,000 policy buyers. But none of them reads like that. I'm impressed, Mr. Steele. Can you tell me why Smith died in a charity ward if he was this conscientious? He didn't have any money or friends or home. He made his living selling papers. Oh, We wouldn't have known about his death except for the fact that the coroner's office called us. What can you tell me about his beneficiary? Lorraine Broderick was just someone who stopped and talked to him one day while he was selling papers. She was 11 years old at the time. She... what? Yes. The agent who sold the policies used to buy his papers from the old boy. One day Smith stopped him and said he wanted to do something nice for a nice little girl named Lorraine Broderick. So he began taking out the policies. The agent have any more background on that part of it? No. Lorraine Broderick met Smith that one afternoon and helped him sell his newspapers. Smith never saw her again after that. Hmm. 1943, she must be 23 or so now. 
Well, I hope she grew up to be the kind of person he thought she was then. Oh, hardly any of us fill out the promise we have at 11 years, Mr. Steele. Then that isn't what I mean. I mean, if he met her that one day when she was a little girl and he made this gesture toward her, and it was tough for him to make those payments all those years, I hope she deserves it. The money doesn't mean anything, but that kind of endorsement from somebody, even an old bird who sells papers on a corner, is worth more than all the money in the world. Uh, does that sound foolish, Mr. Dollar? Not a bit, Mr. Steele. Not a bit. Expense account item two, two dollars. Cab fare to Lorraine Broderick's last known address. 1485 Cushing Street, a broken down apartment house that had probably never seen better days or better neighbors. The owner and manager of the building recalled that Paul and Mary Broderick, parents of Lorraine, had been killed in an automobile accident in 1948. The manager did not know what had become of Lorraine. She had moved out of the apartment two days after the funeral. No forwarding address. Expense account item three, four bits, more cab fare. This time, seven blocks away to Pulaski Street. And a dingy cluster of red brick buildings that were yielding slowly to time and wear. I arrived at three on the dot. I don't think high school's ever changed much. At least this one was no different than the one I'd been in way back when. The persistent smell of pencil sharpeners, ink, discarded lunch rack. Sister Mary Regina? Yes, may I help you? Good afternoon, sister. My name's Johnny Dollar. I wonder if I could talk to you a moment. Uh, Dollar? Yes. Are you sure you shouldn't be speaking to Sister Amadea in the grade school? I don't believe we have any students named Dollar. Oh, no, this... sister. I don't have any children in school here. I've been hired by Eastern Trust Insurance Company to locate a beneficiary on one of their insurance policies. I thought perhaps you might help me. Well, I'll try, Mr. Dollar. I took a chance and came here because it was the nearest high school to the girl's address. Her name is Lorraine Broderick. Lorraine Broderick? Yes. The last trace I have of her was in 1948. She was about 17 then, possibly still in school. Possibly this school. Lorraine Broderick? Mm -hmm. Sound familiar, sister? Uh, in a way, yes. Oh, there are so many, so many, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I just met about 3,000 of them out in the hall. <laughs> yes, I know. 1948. Uh, Benson, Brady, Broderick, Lorraine, Mary, Broderick. Oh. <laughs> yes, Mr. Dollar, your guess was very good. She was here in St. Charles from 1945 to 48, yes. I wonder if there's an address listed there, home address. Um, 1120 Seton Place. Oh, my, that's quite far from here. Uh, parents, deceased, guardian. Oh. Anything wrong, sister? Why, I remember Lorraine now, Mr. Dollar. Her parents were killed in an automobile accident in her senior year. Yes, and she went to live with her uncle, James Broderick, at this seat and address. Oh, yes, yes, I remember that lovely girl. She was in Sister Hildegard's class. That ties up with what I know about her so far, sister. Oh, I remember her so clearly. I can even see her face. Perhaps that was it, her face, like an angel's, gentle and fresh and wonderful. The man who left her the insurance money must have thought the same as you do, sister. He saw her one day when she was 11. Oh, I have an annual from that year, Mr. Dollar. Would you like to see Lorraine? Yes. Uh, right here. Uh, yes, here we are. That's Lorraine Broderick. Beautiful, isn't she? Sister Mary Regina pointed to a group picture on one of the pages. It was labeled Girl Sodality. Lorraine Broderick was in the first row, one of 30 or 40 self-conscious little girls wearing identical self-conscious expressions. Her hair appeared to be deep brown or black, her features soft and slightly cherubic. Undeniably, Lorraine Broderick had been a beautiful young girl. In all probability, she was a beautiful young woman, wherever she was. By five o'clock, I'd been to her uncle's address on Seton Place. There I learned that Uncle James Broderick had died of a heart attack in 1950. The people at the address reported that Lorraine had lived with him up until the time of his death. She had worked in a dentist's office, they told me. As far as they knew, she still worked there. I made a phone call. 
Yes, sir? Johnny Dollar, Mr. Steele. Oh, how are you going on Lorraine Broderick? Well, I might need some help. Have you got a man? Uh, sure. I've got her traced up to 1950, Steele. She worked for a dentist here in town. Uh Uh-huh. Probably got her job in his office right out of high school. That meant she pretty well had to get it through a professional agency. That sounds reasonable. I got a man to check the agencies in town that specialize in that. Let me know. The next day, I was back in St. Charles High School making up a list of names and addresses belonging to students who had been in Lorraine Broderick's graduation class. Out of the ten names I chose at random, I was able to locate only two. Both girls, both married. Both remembered Lorraine Broderick. Neither of them had seen her since graduation. Neither of them was able to furnish any helpful information. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call. Steal again. You want to take this down, Dollar? Yeah, okay. David Pollard. That's Dr. David Pollard, 2950 Tremel Lane. Lorraine Broderick went to work for him as a receptionist in 1949. Got it? Got it. What's his office address? Suite 210, Majestic Building. I got there about a quarter of six. There was no receptionist on duty. As a matter of fact, no reception desk. A stern-looking nurse in a rumpled white uniform knew nothing of a Lorraine Broderick who might have worked for Dr. Doctor was working with a patient. If I cared to wait for doctor... Yes, yes, what is it? My name's Dollar. I'm with the Eastern Trust Insurance Company. I don't need any today, Mr. Dollar. I'm not looking for a sale, doctor. What? That's right. I'm trying to find a friend of yours. Who are you talking about? Lorraine Broderick. Oh. How is Lorraine these days? I don't know, doctor. I'd like to meet her and find out. Well, you're looking in the wrong place. I can't help you. She hasn't been around here for a couple of years. Goodbye. Oh, wait. Well, what now? Well, you've got an awful big chip on your shoulder, Doctor. You won't even let me explain my business. I'm not interested in your business. I can tell you mine's been going on since 8 o'clock this morning, and I'm pretty tired. You finished now? Well, yes. Can I take you downstairs and buy you a drink? Sorry. What is it you want to know? Where I can get in touch with her. I don't know. She quit without notice a couple of years ago, just didn't come back. Too bad, too. Do you have any idea where she might have gone? Just what is this for? To pay her some money we owe her. We can't locate her anywhere. Oh, I'm sorry, but neither can I. Are you still trying? Not anymore. All I know is she just left one day about two years ago. She had a little apartment over on the west side. The manager told me she'd pulled out bag and baggage, and I haven't heard from her since. Were you on, uh, good terms with her, doctor? Doctor? I'll take the drink. Don't misunderstand me, Dollar. She was a real sweet girl. But there was, there was something about her. I don't know. I hope you find her. Or maybe I don't. What are you talking about? She had plans of her own, plans she never told me about. Look, I was in practice three years when she came to work for me, fresh out of high school. With all of it, she still made me feel like a little boy in knee pants. That smile of hers you could take two ways. And the look that went with it. I'm sure she's met a lot of men since she walked out on me, and I'll bet all of them have found out the same thing. What's that? That they've been taken. You mean money? Oh, it wasn't the watch or the necklace or the loans every now and then. It was being taken worse. You know, being used and knowing you're being used. I don't quite get it. And I'll make it clear. That sweet, fresh, beautiful little girl was out to do everything and everybody for all she could get. She's rotten, you know, just plain rotten. Johnny Dollar. This is Carl Walden. There's a message here for me to call you. Oh, yes, Mr. Walden. I'm with Eastern Trust Insurance Company. We're trying to locate an insurance beneficiary named Lorraine Broderick. Understand she lived in your apartment building up until 1953. Who told you that? A doctor she worked for here, Dr. Pollard. I don't know where she is, Mr. Dollar. I haven't seen her for two years. We're trying to pay off a claim, Mr. Walden. Didn't she leave a forwarding address or give you any idea of where she... No, no, not a thing. You've got a job in your hands, pal. Huh? I don't think that baby wants to be found. Got a couple of minutes? Yes. 
I'll be right over. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Broderick matter. Lorraine Broderick, that is, missing. Expense account continued. Item 6, $14 even, photographs. The photographer who had taken the pictures of the 1948 graduating class at St. Charles High School still carried the proofs in his files. Among them, four poses of Lorraine Broderick. I'd stopped by to get them on my way out to see Carl Walden, apartment house manager. He hadn't changed his mind about anything since our phone conversation. No, sir, she doesn't seem to want anybody to know where she is. She'd have left a forwarding address or something like that. Instead, she pulled out in the middle of the night bagging baggage, and that's the last we ever saw of her. Just when was this, Mr. Walden? About the middle of December or so, 1953. Yes, it was a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want one of these? No, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Can you think of any place she might have gone, Mr. Walden? New York City. Oh, why New York? Well, it's the closest place to go, isn't it, for somebody like her? I'm not so sure I know what she was like. I've had several different versions, Mr. Walden. Say, you talked to that doctor she worked for? Yeah. Boy, I'll bet his version was a pip. How do you mean? Well, she walked out on him. That poor guy was around here several times asking if we'd heard from her, if she'd written us a change of address. He didn't say it, but I think he had it real bad for her. Oh? Oh, yeah. And I didn't tell him about the other guy, either. Well, suppose you tell me about the other guy, Mr. Walden. Well, why not? Well? Well, about a week before she left, I saw her in the hall a couple of times with this other guy. Big, gray-haired man, wore Homburgs and things like that. An older man, is that what you mean? Oh, no, not old. Forty-five-ish, maybe. You know, expensive-looking character. Drove a caddy the size of a freight train, New York plates. Buy and sell this place with his pocket money. Happen to know his name? No. He never came around again after she moved out. But they were sure chummy while he was here. At least a couple of times I saw them together. Can't blame him. She was okay. Did she owe you any rent when she left? Nope. Did she give you a notice she was vacating? Nope, just left. A note or anything? A $50 bill on the desk in an envelope addressed to me. That's all. That's it. Well, uh, was she friendly with anybody else in the building? Well, not that I know of. People here keep pretty much themselves. You know, it's a funny thing. What's funny? That old boy with the Hamburg. I wonder why he never came around looking for her. Good question. Expense account item 7, $22, advertisements. I placed ads in the personal columns of every New York paper. Anyone knowing the present whereabouts of Lorraine Broderick, please contact... I spent the rest of the day interviewing the Cadillac dealers in town on the off chance that one of them might have serviced the Cadillac with a New York plate sometime in December of 1953. No one remembered the man Walden had described. I even tried the service records. Impossible to check. The case was stalemated that way for five days. Last Tuesday, things picked up. Johnny Dollar. Uh, hello? Hello, who is this? Uh, Johnny Dollar? Yeah. Can you hear me very well? Johnny, I'm calling from New York. Hey, who is this? Why, it's Lorraine. Lorraine? Yes. Yes, I saw your advertisement in the papers, Johnny. I wondered what you wanted. Johnny. Why, yes, that's what I always called you, isn't it? You never met me before in your life. Hey, what is this? Why, I... Just a moment. Go ahead, Mr. Dameron. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Just what is your business with Lorraine Broderick? I want to find her to pay off an insurance claim. Now, who oh, are you... I see. A... I'm sorry. I asked my secretary to say she was Lorraine. I've been listening on the extension. I'd like a little more explanation than that, Mr. Uh... Dameron. William Dameron. 424 East 47th Street. I know how all this must sound to you, Mr. Dollar, but I'm not trying to confuse you. Well, I am confused. Do you know Lorraine Broderick? Yes, and let's take it from there, Mr. Dameron. Expense account item eight, $15. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to New York for the purpose of seeing Mr. William Dameron, whoever he might be, and trying to gather further information concerning Lorraine Broderick, wherever she might be. 424 East 47th was a 30-story job that housed, among other things, the Union Brokerage Company. 
This happened to be located on a ground-level suite. It also happened that Mr. William Dameron was president of SAME. He looked about the way I expected. Of course I knew Lorraine Broderick, Mr. Dollar. I apologize again for that awkward subterfuge on the telephone. You say you represent an insurance company? That's right. May I see your credentials? Well, sure. Here you are. Mm. Investigator. Thank you. We're trying to pay off on a policy, Mr. Dameron. A man named John Smith left Lorraine Broderick a small estate of $1,500. I see. Can you tell me where she is right now? I'm afraid I can't. Oh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Please. Oh, thanks. I take it you knew her in Hartford. That's right, I did. She came here to New York with me. Oh. Well, let me assure you, there was nothing improper about it. I met Lorraine when she was working for a dentist there, a doctor, or oh, whatever it was. I happened to have had a little dental trouble on a trip there. I found the dentist and I met her. When I suggested she drive to New York with me, I did it with the understanding that we were to be married here. Uh-huh. You, uh, you couldn't have known her very long, Mr. Dameron. A week. No one could have been more surprised than myself at my own conduct. And still more surprised when once we arrived here, Lorraine disappeared. Yeah, that seems to be a habit of hers. Uh, tell me about it, Mr. Dameron. Look, you're talking to me, not the insurance company. Very well. It was Christmas Eve of 1952... Lorraine was staying with my sister Pauline up in Westchester County. I picked her up about six o'clock that evening to go to a party out on Long Island. Between here and Long Island, we stopped for gasoline. I left the car for a moment, and when I came back, Lorraine was gone. And, uh, well, that's it. Did you see her or hear from her after that? No, I didn't. Did she leave a note in the car, a message of some kind? No. I don't quite get this, Mr. Dameron. You were going to be married after you knew her only a week. You brought her here to New York, and a few days later, she just stepped out of your car in a filling station and disappeared. It's quite reasonable from her point of view, I suppose. Well, not from mine. It doesn't make sense. Did you have a fight, an argument or something? Oh, no. Well, no. what was it? Nothing, nothing. I don't think I would ever have argued with Lorraine. Lovely, gentle, sweet. Yeah, I know. What about her things? What things? Well, her clothes out at your sister's. Didn't she send for them, or what? Oh, no, she only had two small bags. They're still there, as far as I know. Well, what did you do? Did you call the police? No. No, why? Well, I would if a girl I was going to marry disappeared like that. No, I'm afraid a call to the police would have been, well, rather awkward, a man in my position. Let me ask you this. Do you have any idea why she walked away? Yes. Perhaps it's of no practical value to you, though. Any information I can get will be helpful, Mr. Well, Chairman. all right, then. I think Lorraine was frightened. Of what? Of life, Mr. Dollar. Not people or circumstances, but, but life. Yes. You say that with a lot of conviction. Yes. Lorraine had always been, well, a poor girl. She lived with a rather decrepit uncle for a time after her parents were killed in an accident, an automobile accident, she said. I think that I... I offered her the happiness and security she had always longed for... But I also think she was not mature enough or adjusted well enough to accept it. <laughs> this is of no value, is it? Well, it might be. Can you tell me if she ever spoke of any ambitions? Maybe maybe she wanted to go on the stage or become a nurse. Something. Lorraine simply wanted to be my wife and live here. I can see you find that difficult to believe when I'm almost old enough to have been her father. That is not the reason Lorraine walked away from the car that night. Believe me, Mr. Dollarness, I'm terribly mistaken. She was very much in love with me and wanted to marry me. Have you tried to find her, Mr. Dameron? No. No, I have not. I waited around the filling station that night hoping she'd return, but I didn't report the matter to the police, as I said before. I intended to hire private detectives to locate her, but then I gave that up, too. I'm afraid I don't understand this. If you loved her... Would this make it more understandable... Lorraine was a rational, normal human being when I left her in that car. No one forced her away from it, or me. The man at the filling station said she merely stepped out and disappeared down the street. She left of her own free will, for her own reasons. Hmm. I think I see your point. Thank you. I have hoped that one day she would appear at my door, contact me, come to me. But she hasn't. 
The most matchless woman I've ever known. <laughs> Is there any way I can help you more concretely? If you could tell me the exact location of that filling station. Yes, I believe I can do that, but why? Last place she was seen alive. Ooh, that word alive. Just a word, Mr. Dameron. Have you spoken to many people who knew her? A few. The dentist she worked for, an apartment house manager, principal in her high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they all told me the truth. The, the what? The truth. You know, how it actually was. What really happened. Oh, I... Mr. I, Dameron... I, she would have run out on you in Westchester, taken a cab from your sister's place with her luggage, or she could have come to you and called off the marriage. Mr. Dollar, please. Now, looking at you and talking to you, anyone would be impressed by the fact that you're a reasonable and understanding man. I am. She could have left you a dozen easier ways, Mr. Dameron, but it doesn't stand to reason that she'd step out of a car on Christmas Eve on the way to a party and disappear. With no luggage, with the clothes on her back, and no more. Women don't do things like that. They want an overnight bag, a change of clothes, somewhere to go to. It doesn't make sense. But that's exactly what she did. They Mr. don't do it that way unless there's a mighty good reason. A real guilt edge reason, Mr. Dameron. Something that says what's ahead is better than what's being left. How much did she swipe? What? What did she take? How much? Close to $6,500. $6,500. Lovely, sweet, gentle. She took it from the wallet in my overcoat while I was talking to the filling station attendant. I would have given it to her gladly. All of this, everything. But she had to steal it from me. She had to steal it from me like some common little thief. <laughs> There's truly no fool like an old fool. Is there, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> There'll be another intriguing episode of the Broderick Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, when the trail really gets hot and goes right down on a police blotter. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, fans of uh, the old-time radio uh, westerns program uh, will re recognize immediately the voice of John Daner, uh, who played Paladin and also played the lead over on um, Frontier um, on a Frontier Gentleman. Uh, this was a pretty interesting episode as we're getting these uh, conflicting pictures of uh of uh the missing woman and uh this is kind of building to just a very well done well told uh, character piece and it's going to be interesting to see how this um uh how this plays out uh you'll want to definitely be with us this week uh as we continue this on Wednesday with part 3 and part 4 of the Broderick matter all right well uh we uh we start off, we uh, turn to listener comments and feedback, and I uh, received this from Avery, who writes, Hello, Mr. Graham. I, 
<clears throat> I thought I would sit down uh, and write to you how much I appreciate your shows, both of them. Your show is not only informative, but also a great way to get all the wonderful episodes of the Lost Radio Land Detectives. The show, The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, is definitely one of my favorites. Your Dragnet show is quite professional and very interesting. I must congratulate you on such a wonderful show. I also wanted to bring your attention that I'm a 17-year-old boy who wears suits, ties, and trench coats, and the occasional fedora, and very much a devoted fan of Gerald Moore, Jack Webb, and Tudor Owen. My favorite shows are Escape, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, and Pat Novak for Hire. I was introduced to radio drama by my great uncle Bill, uh, who showed me an episode of Pat Novak when I was very young. I've loved the shows of the 40s for as long as I can remember. I used to dream of creating my own radio drama. So last summer, I sat down in front of my computer and wrote myself a script to an original radio detective named Eddie Mackin. I pitched the show to the local radio station, and the show was approved using a totally volunteer cast. And the largest booth the station has, Eddie Mackin Private Eye, is well on its way to becoming a long-running series. Uh, for a little information on Mackin himself and his world, Mackin's a private eye from San Francisco, fresh from Korea in 1952. Here he stays and sets up his office on the third floor floor of the of uh, the McKay's uh, San Francisco Sunshine Boarding House, where Katie McKay, the owner's granddaughter, is both beautiful and dangerous. Between weird clients and crooked cops, Mackin has his hands full from tigers to kidnappers. And while it's not exactly Novak San Fran, I do believe old-time radio lovers like myself would love to hear an original radio drama written in the style of old uh, radio detective shows, but a new fresh detective. You can look up my sh show on YouTube under Eddie Mackin. That's E-D-D-I-E-M-A-C-K-I-N, Private Eye. So far, I've done four of my personally written episodes, as well as several uh, radio scripts redone. We've done episodes of Philip Marlowe, uh, Pat Novak, Dragnet, and Nero Wolf. And they, that's just the start. Every Sunday night, you can tune in at 5.30 at 13 a.m. 1340, the Rancho Salida, Colorado. The station has an online listening option uh, on the KV. KVRH AM 1340 The Ranch, Salida, Colorado website. Uh, so you can listen anytime on YouTube. I just thought that uh, once all of us fans uh, here enjoy your show so much and love old radio so much, some may be interested in listening to my program. So far, the show has been fairly successful. Hope that if you can tune in, uh, whoever you are, wherever you are, from old radio fan, one old radio fan to another, enjoy. Uh, thanks for reading my email. A very gracious and thankful Avery Martinez. Well, thanks so much, Avery. You know, um, and I know, uh, I just read this, uh, email, which provides a lot of a uh, plug for his program, but I, I just, uh, appreciate so much, you know, taking the effort, uh, to do that. And I sat down and I did listen to the first episode of Eddie Mackin. And with an all volunteer cast, I'd say that it's, I'd say that it's a good start. And I'll say this for, uh, Avery as Eddie Mackin, that, uh, when I listen to it, he really, um, in his characterization and his acting, did an extremely good job of capturing, uh, the spirit of the 1940s, uh, detectives. I really, if he hadn't indeed met, emailed me, um, I would not have thought that he was uh, uh, 17. So a phenomenal job on that. And I just encourage him to uh, keep uh, working, uh, keep working with it, keep learning, keep enjoying, and uh, keep listening to the program. So uh, all the best to you, uh, Avery, and all you're doing uh, down there in Colorado. I also uh, want to thank Chuck B., um, who uh, went ahead and uh, used his uh, Twitter account to encourage his followers to check out the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio and provided our, our address, a great way to promote the show. And thank you so much, Chuck. All right, well, that will do it for today. Again, back here on Wednesday, part three of the Broderick Matter. And uh, then join us tomorrow as we begin our new series, The Big Guy. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. 
Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>